Maintenance Treatment of Venous Thromboembolism What is the maintenance treatment of deep vein thrombosis or pulmonary embolism? Treatment with therapeutic doses of subcutaneous low-molecular weight heparin should be employed during the remainder of the pregnancy and for at least 6 weeks postnatally and until at least 3 months of treatment has been given in total. Women should be thought to self-inject low-molecular weight heparin and arrangements made to allow safe disposal of needles and syringes. Outpatient follow-up should include clinical assessment and advice with monitoring of blood platelets and peak anti-10A levels if appropriate. Pregnant women who develop heparin-induced thrombocytopenia or have heparin allergy and require continuing anticoagulant therapy should be managed with an alternative anticoagulant under specialist advice. Women with antenatal VTE can be managed with subcutaneous therapeutic doses of low molecular weight heparin for the remainder of the pregnancy. If low molecular weight heparin therapy requires monitoring, for example, extremes of body weight or renal impairment, the aim is to achieve a peak anti 10A activity 3 hours post injection of 0.5 to 1.2 units per ml. The rationale for recommending therapeutic doses of low molecular weight heparin rather than reduced prophylactic doses throughout the remainder of the pregnancy is based on the continuing risk of recurrent venous thromboembolism during this time arising from pregnancy-related changes in the coagulation system, reduced venous flow velocity, a higher incidence of isolated iliac vein deep vein thrombosis in pregnancy, and in at least 50% of patients, a thrombophilia will be present. Reducing to an intermediate dose may be useful in pregnant women at increased risk of bleeding or osteoporosis. Women should be thought to self-inject and can then be managed as outpatients until delivery. Allergic skin reactions to heparin can occur and may require the heparin preparation to be changed. All lesions were caused by allergic delayed type hypersensitivity reactions. In women who are unable to tolerate heparin, usually because of allergic skin reactions, without evidence of heparin-induced thrombocytopenia, an alternative low molecular weight heparin can be prescribed, although the cross reactivity rate to different heparin preparations is 33.3%. Where the problem persists, or in women with HIT, the use of the naparoid, a low molecular weight heparinoid, can be considered. The naparoid is an effective and safe anti thrombotic in pregnancy for women who are intolerant of heparin. Can vitamin K antagonist be used during pregnancy for the maintenance treatment of venous thromboembolism? Because of their adverse effects on the fetus, vitamin K antagonists such as warfarin should not be used for antenatal venous thromboembolism treatment. Vitamin K antagonists cross the placenta readily and are associated with adverse pregnancy outcomes, including miscarriage, prematurity, low birth weight, neurodevelopmental problems, and fetal and neonatal bleeding. They are also associated with a characteristic embryopathy following fetal exposure in the first trimester. Is there a role for the new anticoagulants in the treatment of venous thromboembolism in pregnancy? Consideration should be given to the use of newer anticoagulants such as Fondaparinox, Argathroban, or Arherodin in pregnant women who are unable to tolerate heparin or low molecular weight heparin or unfractionated heparin or the naparoid and who require continuing anticoagulant therapy. These preparations are administered parenterally and include Fondaparinox, a selective factor 10A inhibitor, Agathroban, a direct thrombin inhibitor, and Arherodin, a direct thrombin inhibitor.
the non-vitamin K antagonist oral anticoagulants are likely to cross the placenta and have potential direct fetal effects, they should therefore be avoided in the antenatal period. Anticoagulant therapy during labor and delivery. Should anticoagulant therapy be altered during labor and delivery? When venous thromboembolism occurs at term, consideration should be given to the use of intravenous unfractionated heparin, which is more easily manipulated. The women in low molecular weight heparin for maintenance therapy should be advised that once she is in established labor or thinks that she is in labor, she should not inject any further heparin. Where delivery is planned, either by elective cesarean section or induction of labor, low molecular weight heparin maintenance therapy should be discontinued 24 hours prior to planned delivery. Regional anesthetic or analgesic techniques should not be undertaken until at least 24 hours after the last dose of therapeutic low molecular weight heparin. Low molecular weight heparin should not be given for 4 hours after the use of spinal anesthesia or after the epidural catheter has been removed and the epidural catheter should not be removed within 12 hours of the most recent injection. Where possible, anticoagulant therapy should be altered to avoid an unwanted anticoagulant effect during delivery. For elective delivery, low molecular weight heparin should be stopped 24 hours before induction of labor or cesarean section. Subcutaneous unfractionated heparin should be discontinued 12 hours before and intravenous unfractionated heparin stopped 6 hours before induction of labor or regional anesthesia. Women who present in labor shortly after injecting low molecular weight heparin can be reassured that bleeding complications are very uncommon with low molecular weight heparin. If a spontaneous labor occurs in women receiving therapeutic doses of subcutaneous unfractionated heparin, careful monitoring of the APTT is required. If it is markedly prolonged near delivery, protamine sulfate may be required to reduce the risk of bleeding. When venous thromboembolism occurs at term, the risk of recurrent thrombosis may be increased if anticoagulant therapy is discontinued to allow a planned induction of labor or cesarean section. One study suggested that the risk of recurrent VTE is higher within two weeks of the initial thrombosis. Consideration can be given to the use of intravenous unfractionated heparin, which is more easily manipulated, and because of its shorter half-life, minimizes the duration without anticoagulant therapy. The incidence of spinal hematoma after regional anesthesia with or without antithrombotic therapy in the obstetric population is unknown. For delivery by elective cesarean section, the treatment doses of low molecular weight heparin should be omitted for 24 hours prior to surgery. A thromboprophylactic dose of low molecular weight heparin, enoxaparin 40 mg, daltaparin 5000 international units, tinzaparin 75 international units per kilogram should be given 4 hours postoperatively, at least 4 hours after removal of the epidural catheter if appropriate, and the treatment dose recommends 8 to 12 hours later. Are specific surgical measures required for anticoagulated patients undergoing delivery by cesarean section? In patients receiving therapeutic doses of low molecular weight heparin, wound drains, abdominal and rectal sheet should be considered at cesarean section, and the skin incision should be closed with interrupted sutures to allow drainage of any hematoma. A case control study has reported an increased incidence of wound complications in women receiving peripartum anticoagulation. What anticoagulant therapy should be employed in women at high risk of hemorrhage? Any woman who is considered to be at high risk of hemorrhage and in whom continued heparin treatment is considered essential 
should be managed with intravenous and fractionated heparin until the risk factors for hemorrhage have resolved. Unfractionated heparin has a shorter half-life than low molecular weight heparin and its activity is more completely reversed with protamine sulfate. It should therefore be used in situations when anticoagulation is required but concerns exist regarding bleeding. These situations include antipartum hemorrhage, coagulopathy, progressive wound hematoma, suspected intra-abdominal bleeding, and postpartum hemorrhage. If a woman develops a hemorrhagic problem while on low molecular weight heparin, the treatment should be stopped and advised sought from a hematologist. Protamine sulfate reverses the anti-2A fraction of low molecular weight heparin but does not fully reverse the anti-10A effect. Case series have shown that it is useful in the management of bleeding associated with low molecular weight heparin in some, but not all, patients. Postnatal anticoagulation. How should anticoagulation be managed postnatally? Therapeutic anticoagulant therapy should be continued for the duration of the pregnancy and for at least six weeks postnatally and until at least three months of treatment has been given in total. Before discontinuing treatment, the continuing risk of thrombosis should be assessed. Women should be offered a choice of low molecular weight heparin or oral anticoagulant for postnatal therapy after discussion about the need for regular blood tests for monitoring of warfarin, particularly during the first 10 days of treatment. Postpartum warfarin should be avoided until at least the fifth day and for longer in women at increased risk of postpartum hemorrhage. Women should be advised that neither heparin, unfractionated or low molecular weight heparin, nor warfarin is contraindicated in breastfeeding. Both heparin and warfarin are satisfactory for use postpartum. New or novel oral anticoagulants could be considered in women who are not breastfeeding although no reports were identified of their use in the puerperium. Before discontinuing treatment, the continuing risk of thrombosis should be assessed. If the woman chooses to continue with low molecular weight heparin postnatally, then the doses and dosage schedule that were employed antenatally should be continued. If the woman chooses to commence warfarin postpartum, this should be avoided until at least the fifth postnatal day. Daily testing of the International Normalized Ratio or INR is recommended during the transfer from low molecular weight heparin to warfarin to avoid over anticoagulation. Warfarin administration should be delayed in women considered to be at risk of postpartum hemorrhage. The postpartum women require larger doses of warfarin and take significantly longer to reach therapeutic INR. The coagulation changes that occur in pregnancy and persist into the puerperium antagonize warfarin and may justify higher loading doses. The INR should be checked on day 2 of warfarin treatment and subsequent warfarin doses titrated to maintain the INR between 2.0 and 3.0. Heparin treatment should be continued until the INR is greater than 2.0 for at least 24 hours. Neither heparin, unfractionated or low molecular weight heparin, nor warfarin is contraindicated in breastfeeding. Since neither unfractionated heparin nor low molecular weight heparin is orally active, no clinical effect would be anticipated in the infant. Warfarin does not pass into breast milk to any measurable degree. It is 99% bound to serum proteins, which results in minimal transfer to breast milk. Prevention of post-thrombotic syndrome. What measures can be employed to prevent the development of post-thrombotic syndrome? Women should be advised that prolonged use of low molecular weight heparin, more than 12 weeks, is associated with a significantly lower chance of developing post-thrombotic syndrome. 
following a deep vein thrombosis, a graduated elastic compression stockings should be worn on the affected leg to reduce pain and swelling. Clinicians should be aware that the role of compression stockings in the prevention of post-thrombotic syndrome is unclear. The post-thrombotic syndrome, or PTS, is characterized by chronic persistent leg swelling, pain of feeling of heaviness, dependent cyanosis, telangiectasis, chronic pigmentation, eczema, associated varicose veins, and in the most severe cases, venous ulceration. Smoking and age greater than 33 years were independent predictors of the development of post-thrombotic syndrome. Other recognized risk factors include recurrent ipsilateral DVT and obesity. A randomized controlled trial of long-term use of low molecular weight heparin, tinzaparin for more than 12 weeks versus tinzaparin for 5 days, then warfarin for 12 weeks in patients with proximal DVT reported a significantly lower rate of PTS in patients allocated to prolong low molecular weight heparin. A sub-analysis has shown that the benefits of prolonged low molecular weight heparin are even greater for iliac vein DVT. Postnatal Clinic Review Postnatal review for patients who develop venous thromboembolism during pregnancy or the puriperium should, whenever possible, be at an obstetric medicine clinic or a joint obstetric hematology clinic. Thrombophilia testing should be performed once anticoagulant therapy has been discontinued, only if it is considered that the results would influence the woman's future management. At the postnatal review, an assessment should be made of post-thrombotic venous damage and advice should be given on the need for thromboprophylaxis in any future pregnancy and at other times of increased risk. Thrombophilia testing should be performed once anticoagulant therapy has been discontinued and only if it is considered that the results would influence the woman's future management. Testing will not alter the duration and intensity of acute treatment but may alter prophylaxis in subsequent pregnancy. Appendix number 1. Algorithm for the investigation and initial management of suspected pulmonary embolism in pregnancy and the pure perium.